All right, so the last thing that we're really going to talk about before we talk about humans and primates along this, this kind of biological continuum is um, whether primates have culture. You know, we, we have to, of course, figure out a working definition of culture, which is not even all that easy within anthropology. Um, anthropology is very quick to, to define culture as anything that's not not culture. It's really hard to define things by the exclusion of other traits. So um, typically in, in when we're defining culture um, in a four-field approach to anthropology or in cultural anthropology in general, uh, we talk about things that are arbitrary, things that are learned or, or um, transmitted kind of laterally. Uh, we talk about symbolic um, aspects that culture is built on symbolism. We talk about how culture is integrated into dominant economic activities, how uh, culture is all encompassing and talks about every aspect of human um, phenotypic expression, not just biology, but also behavior, not just what we would consider um, sophisticated or um, kind of cultured behaviors like opera, but also uh, rap music, um, also, you know, not just the art of the masters, but also graffiti art. Um, these are what we use as kind of markers for when what we're talking about in humans is considered full-fledged, fully elaborated culture. With primates, that's a little harder to do. Right, um, And so much of cultural anthropology is spent um, basically justifying how humans are exceptional, how what humans do is culture, what primates do is not. Biological anthropologists would refute that. We would argue, evolutionary anthropologists would argue that there are at least rudimentary building blocks of human culture present in many non-human species, not just non-human primates. And so that we have to recon recognize that although aspects of human culture are unique um, and are, are certainly by degree expressed more magnificently among human populations, that at least maybe the cognition for culture is present in non-human populations. That, you know, we may have some evolutionary basis for the capacity for culture. This is particularly true uh, as we look at increased brain size and social learning. So it's particularly going to be true among uh, apes relative to monkeys, among monkeys relative to prosimians. Um, one important aspect of culture is that it is learned. Human culture is also thusly symbolic and arbitrary. Um, so there are some similarities that we see cognitively between primate, non-human primates and humans that would allow us to argue that there are some building blocks of culture present in primates. Um, we learn through trial and error. Both non-human primates and humans do that. Um, we also learn through social observation. There are, of course, some very important differences. I will put up in the optional resources for this week uh, a video about an experiment that was done with chimpanzees and human children. Um, and it has to do with a box, and that box has something um, pleasurable inside. It's Starburst or gummy bears or, you know, some reward candy that both chimps and humans are motivated to get to. Um, when that box is opaque, both humans and chimps appear to imitate. Um, they do the exact um, uh, actions that the researcher did in order to get that reward out of that box. When the box uh, is changed to be transparent um, and demonstrates then a false floor uh, uh, to the point that you realize that all of the early actions were superfluous and not related whatsoever to getting the reward out. Chimpanzees cut out all of the unnecessary movements. It's only human children who imitate blindly. Uh, and so from that viewpoint, perhaps we could say that chimps are even smarter than human children in that chimps will cut to the chase, they will eliminate unnecessary steps. Um, but that's not the full picture. Right? Because one of the things that human children do is blindly imitate. Why do they blindly imitate? Well, because that's associated with this arbitrariness and this mastery of, of symbolic cultural traits. 
what blind imitation allows for is the buildup of culture, uh, what we call cultural consolidation. And we've already talked about how that's pretty important, right? That um, humans are able to build up a collective knowledge base that extends farther back than you have been alive. So what this does ecologically is allows us to uh, do better at coping with exceedingly rare events. So maybe it's a 500 year drought cycle. Maybe it's the um, expansion of or retreat of glaciers. By having cultural consolidation and having the knowledge set through oral traditions that our ancestors used to deal with those rare situations, we are better able to cope with those. And so this is an advantage that comes with larger brain size and comes with more uh, elaborate presentation of culture, a more elaborated cultural adaptation. Um, and so this ability to imitate and to do so blindly as children is associated with a greater reliance on cultural adaptation rather than biological adaptation. So what we're seeing with chimps who only blindly imitate where there's no indication not to, um, is a emerging ability to cope with things culturally. Whereas what we see with humans who will blindly imitate even when not necessary is an elaborated reliance upon cultural solutions. Uh, so some examples of primate quote-unquote culture. On um, the Kashima Island of Japan, we have a population of... <coughs> Japanese macaques or snow monkeys named Arishiyama. They were split in the 1970s and Arishiyama East stayed on the Koshima Island of Japan while Arishiyama West came to Dili, Texas um, and now lives as a semi-feral uh, colony of Japanese macaques in southern Texas. Um, they, is, they are technically um, enclosed uh, but uh, and they were used for biomedical and, and psychological testing. They've uh, somewhat been retired, and I think the sanctuary is called Born Free. Um, but they escape all the time, and ranchers have a an agreement that they can shoot them on site if they're raiding crops or raising, raiding their animal stores or whatever. Um, anyway, because they were used for particular studies, they were provisioned. And one of the ways they were provisioned was by airdrops of food. Um, one time in the uh, 1970s, um, the drop of sweet potatoes landed in a stream instead of um, on the sand and one single female noted that uh, that washed the dirt off of the uh, the potatoes and so subsequently she started washing all of her potatoes when she got them not just those that had been dropped in the stream um, this very 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 slowly spread through the population um, and uh, this slow pace of spread has some primatologists arguing that it's not really um, cultural transmission, that they're not learning laterally, um, that she didn't teach her offspring, uh, that rather this is trial and error, and it now results in uh, animals that wash their sweet potatoes in the ocean. And of course, if you wash your sweet potatoes in the ocean, you also get salt deposits on them, which may improve their flavor. Um, orangutans show regional variation in some behaviors, including how their nests are built and used, um, whether it's overlapping or underlying branches, using branches to swat insects also using plants uh, that they crush and spread on their bodies to reduce insect bites particularly mosquito bites uh, and then the use of their hands to amplify their vocalizations they will put a funnel around their mouth kind of like we do to make our voice uh, project farther um, you know some of these are um, are probably hallmarks of culture, particularly when we only see some things used regionally. Uh, gorillas will have started, uh, juvenile gorillas, uh, mountain gorillas in particular, have started freeing uh, their group mates from snares. They've also extended that behavior to, um, to non-gorilla species. If they see um, a gazelles or something uh, trapped by snares or, or small deer that are trapped by snares, they will also free uh, those ungulates. So um, maybe this is going to be a cultural behavior that will be able to help combat um, some pretty high predation or poaching pressures on mountain gorillas. Um, it's not something that has spread too widely yet, um, so it's a newly innovative behavior. Chimpanzees use tools for foraging. They will use tools for cracking nuts, 
They will also termite fish uh, and ant dip. They will honey dip as well. So using a stick to uh, poke into the termite mound, into the beehive, into uh, the um, ants that are biting ants to minimize the likelihood that they're bitten, but allow them to still reach those ants that are high in protein. Um, gorilla or chimpanzees have also only about over the past 10 years. I think 2007 was the first field season where this was observed, have been fashioning spears out of uh, branches and using those spears to probe uh, galago or bush baby sleeping dens, um, sometimes coming out with bush baby on a stick. Thus far, the only, pe uh, the only chimps who've been observed doing this behavior uh, have been adult females and then their uh, adolescent offspring. Um, we haven't seen adult males start to demonstrate this behavior yet, and this behavior is very limited in the range of chimpanzees who practice it. So this is arguably a newly emerging cultural trait. One important thing about tool use among both chimps and capuchins versus tool use among early hominins is that tools um, are not modified. Um, so that means that uh, that when they're using stones to crack open um, nuts, they're picking up just a, a stone that has the right characteristics. It's large and hard and heavy enough to break open a nut. They're, they will transport those stones. Capuchins uh, will transport stones that are about 20-25% of their body weight. Uh, they will transport good stones to nut cracking sites um, or they will transport nuts to good stones but they're not breaking off flakes like early hominins do with old wand pebble tools they're not sharpening those stones they're not getting those stones to a point to where they can administer a strike um, at a particular pressure point for example they are taking something out of their environment and using it strategically to get to something embedded in their environment, but they are not modifying it anyway. So uh, we argue as, as evolutionary anthropologists and as um, primatologists as to whether this qualifies as abstract representation. Are they looking at the raw material and imagining what it could be, uh, like later hominins are going to do? Having an abstract mental template of what they want to kind of accomplish with that stone. Um, and so there are some primatologists even who say that tool use is not cultural behavior among primates um, because they are not doing something arbitrary. They're not really modifying that stone. Um, there are behaviors that are purely arbitrary, though, among chimpanzees, and greeting displays are one of those. Uh, chimps from different regions have different ways of recognizing in-group from out-group. They all serve the same function. Being able to identify in-group from out-group helps you know who's friend and foe, helps you then target aggression only towards non-group members. Um, among captive chimpanzees, we have to teach them how to do what's called a wrist present, where you hold your wrist out uh, and your wrist is going to be sniffed by someone. Um, that is, by and large, what's taught across the board to hand-reared captive chimps. Wild chimps do a variety of different grasping behaviors. Uh, they will clasp hands. Sometimes they will only clasp one hand. Sometimes they will clasp two hands. Sometimes they will clasp one hand and embrace with a hug around the shoulders. Um, when they're clasping hands, sometimes they will wrap their fingers around one another. In some locations, they will wrap their whole wrist around the other's wrist. So we see regional variation in how that greeting display is expressed. The function remains the same. The expression is purely arbitrary and is a function of where you learned how to greet other chimpanzees. So um, from that viewpoint, these greeting displays are really likely candidates for chimpanzee cultural behavior. Chimps have also recently been observed throwing stones into the cavities of trees, and some people have theorized that these trees are somehow quote unquote sacred to those chimps and that this represents some non-human primate um, basis for religious expression and ritual. I'll also post a video of the uh, chimp stone throwing behaviors and, and let you kind of see it for yourself so that you can have an idea of what it is that we're talking about. Um, most primatologists discount this interpretation of that behavior as ritual or religion. Um, 
just because, I mean, that's anthropomorphizing an awful lot. We don't, we, it hasn't been going on for long enough for us to determine the significance. It could just be a short-lived aberrant behavior. It could be something they've observed children doing. Um, you know, the jury's still out as to rather, whether this represents religiosity among non-human species. Um, this last bullet point, capuchin monkeys they even dig up roots and tubers. They are the only non-human primate that's been seen digging up roots and tubers. File that away in the back of your mind for next week when we start talking about hominin evolution because as we move out into the African savanna as early hominins, guess what is there in abundance? Roots and tubers. Plants change where the bulk of their biomass is. And so in forests, the bulk of the biomass is above ground in the form of fruits and leaves. In savanna habitats, in desert habitats, the bulk of the biomass is below ground in the form of tap roots and tubers. So being able to dig up tubers is going to be incredibly important for early hominin populations. And so here we have some of these primate examples. This top one, we've got an orangutan who probes the depth of water crossings or, or water features before going in them. Um, this particular female orangutan likes to submerge her body in water, but because orangutans can't swim, um, she's testing for the depth. Now, this photo, if you look for it on the internet is going to be uh, categorized as orangutan's uh, spear fishing, which she is not doing. She's not spear fishing. She is only testing the depth of the water. So uh, pop culture references to some of these pictures have the captions totally wrong, i.e. there's fake primate news just as there is fake human news. We've got a chimpanzee nut cracking on the bottom left, a capuchin nut cracking on the middle top. Um, uh, Barb or, um, uh, sorry, um, Burmese macaques uh, who are uh, cracking open, also called crab-eating macaques, uh, who are cracking open shellfish using rocks to open up shellfish. We've got a chimpanzee on the top right uh, who's probing for termites, and then here on the bottom right we have the gorilla, mount, the mountain gorilla youngsters who are dismantling snare traps to uh, kind of combat against poaching in their own habitat. Language is one other cultural feature, uh, factors very heavily into human culture, um, has at least the rudimentary building blocks of the cognition necessary for it in non-human primates. Um, call systems are hardwired, language or communication systems may not always be hardwired. So language includes arbitrary vocal sounds, that key thing being the arbitrariness of them, um, and arbitrary written symbols though writing only arose about 6,000 years ago. Call systems are thought to be hardwired, automatic vocalizations that are associated with specific environmental stimuli. For example, vervet monkeys have predator-specific alarm calls that communicate not only that a predator has been detected, but also communicate what type of predator it is. So these hardwired alarm calls are not considered to be language because um, they are associated with very, very specific uh, environmental stimuli. So you only make a leopard call when you are faced with a leopard as a predator. You don't make a leopard call when you're faced with an eagle as a predator. However, Vervet monkeys have been shown to be selectively mute. Specifically, subordinate individuals detect calls as often as dominant individuals, but they don't make the calls because uh, by staying silent, they increase the likelihood that a dominant individual is going to get picked off by a predator, thus potentially raising their own social status. So even in these cases where the vocalizations are hardwired, um, these vocalizations might not be made. Chimpanzees have a vocalization that's associated with food that's really, really delectable, like a tree that's just laden with ripe figs, or a pile of Skittles or Starburst. <clears throat> you know, something super sweet um, that is really desirable. They make that vocalization um, whether they want to or not. And what happens is that vocalization brings all the boys, you know, my milkshake brings the boys to the yard. Not really what that means, but um, that vocalization brings 
the competition uh, to the the uh, feeding area. And so by making that vocalization, chimpanzees decrease the amount of that delectable food they get for themselves. However, they can't not mo- make the vocalization. So what they do is they put their hand over their mouth. They muffle the sound of it. You know, by putting your hand over your mouth, you're muffling the sound of that vocalization, which minimizes the number of conspecifics that might be able to hear you, which means that you're not going to have as many other animals there uh, competing for access to that resource. So even when calls are hardwired, we can come up with some interesting behavioral ways to minimize the outcomes or, or effects of those calls. Um, Great apes have demonstrated through their mastery of things like uh, sign language and lexigram use, at least the uh, rudimentary cognitive basis, the cognitive capacity for language. They do not have the vocal apparatus, though, that produces speech. So uh, Washoe, Lucy, Coco have all been sign language uh, using, ASL using um, great apes um, and Coco and then Washo are pictured in those first two images. The third is Kanzi with his mastery of lexigram use. Kanzi uses this lexigram board to communicate his wants, his needs, his desires. Interestingly, Sue Savage Rumball's work with bonobos has also demonstrated that they will use this lexigram board with one another. Um, they will come together and categorize and plan um, out events several days in the future. So bonobos may even be better at language cognition um, than even common chimps. Um, That's going to be your assignment for this week is going to be uh, one of the activities will be uh, to watch Sue Savage Rumball's TED Talk on um, basically the language and cultural capabilities of bonobos. So apes have the rudimentary cognitive capacity that's associated with language use. However, they don't produce spoken language. When we think about the emergence of spoken language, uh, we quibble about the when. Is it something that only came about with um, our, our genus and species, with archaic Homo sapiens or even modern Homo sapiens? Or did earlier forms of the genus Homo have speech? I tend to find myself in the latter camp, that based on the cultural capabilities of Homo erectus, it would be naive of us to think that Homo erectus didn't at least have rudimentary spoken speech. I mean, after all, Homo erectus built boats or rafts, um, cooperatively hunted, left the African savanna, and uh, pushed into more temperate areas. Um, But these early changes that allow for human speech aren't really necessarily changes in the brain, per se, um, as they are just reorganization. We didn't grow new speech structures. What we did firstly was... uh, changed existing neurological structures um, and changing how they connected to one another. So we have a mutation in a gene called the FOXP2 gene that is associated with language, but not because it confers a specific benefit to language per se. It is associated with fine motor control of the tongue, and so that could also be involved in uh, feeding behaviors and swallowing behaviors. Um, But in it, it's uh, in the way that our tongue is implicated in uh, producing spoken sounds, having the human um, mutation of the FOXP2 gene gives you the ability to enunciate your speech. Um, there are some humans who still have the chimp version of the FOXP2 gene. It's not a new gene, it's just a different allele, um, and they tend to slur their speech. So, uh, you know, we see just modifications of existing structures, not the innovation of totally new structures. We uh, see the movement of the hyoid bone, for example, being associated with the capacity for speech. Um, Communication was important prior to hominins ever evolving, and so even our non-human primate ancestors had Uh, selection that favored the capacity for communication and specifically producing messages um, that conveyed information like the kind of predator that uh, that you detected. That useful information results in different behavioral responses based on whether it's a terrestrial uh, or an avian predator. 
So natural selection then would favor additional anatomical and neurological changes that enhanced hominin's ability to use spoken language. Maybe this is larger home range size and a further distance that our message had to travel. Maybe this was um, with even finer nuances in the information that we had to communicate. It wasn't an all or nothing thing that just magically appeared though with the advent of anatomically modern homo sapiens. It is something that the cognitive capacity was already laid down before we diverged from our last human chimp ancestor and probably even before our last human gorilla ancestor. And rather, it is existing uh, structures that were modified specifically in this ecological context that early hominins found themselves in that favored the that favored the gradual development of spoken human speech. That question of when, though, still remains. And so that brings us to this idea of thinking of humans and non-humans as two ends of a continuum. We have a behavioral and biological spectrum. We as humans tend to set ourselves off as outliers and special in some way um, when really we share a lot of primate features and primates when compared to other non-primate mammals are indeed um, special and unique in key characteristic ways. Um, so though we are at one end of a biological spectrum we can see a lot of the biological base for many of our behaviors present in our last common ancestor. And so when we compare ourselves to um, chimps and bonobos, um, our neurological processes are functionally the same. Our genetic material is functionally the same. We only have about 1.6 degree of difference um, in coding regions of our DNA. Our developmental stages are functionally the same. Our dependent on on learning is very similar. We all have a capacity for both very aggressive behaviors like warfare and murder, but also a capacity for incredibly affiliative and pro-social behaviors like altruism, um, like friendship formation. Um, the main differences that we see between humans and non-humans are a, a issue of degree or degree of expression. Um, we are both more adept at cruelty and aggression but also more adept at compassion. We can have cooperation at the societal level and you know have uh, cultures that are millions of people cooperating rather than just a couple hundred individuals cooperating. Um, similarly our degree to murder um, and discriminate against is uh, magnified relative to non-human species. So um, we are also able to reflect upon our own behavior on, in a way that non-human species aren't. So um, our ability to pontificate on the morality of our own behavior, our ability to analyze our motivations, our ability to see that even when behaviors are pretty hardwired, pretty biologically determined, we can also draw um, a relationship to what's wrong and what's right. So sometimes you get so angry you want to throat punch somebody or you want to kill them, right? But we do have the capacity not to uh, act out on those behaviors and follow through. So even though we feel like we want to kill somebody, we know that it's not beneficial to society, beneficial to ourselves even, uh, to go ahead and murder our competitors. So there are things that humans do that absolutely are unique, but they're unique in that degree of expression. You know, your book talks about how <clears throat> humans are uh, are outliers among mammals even, and that we are the only species that do such and such, like communicate through spoken language. I think your book is not giving enough credit to cetaceans, specifically toothed whales, uh, dolphins, porpoises, orcas, etc. Um, I think our uh, prejudice or our, our speciesist take on culture and language um, is driven by the fact that we don't understand what dolphins are saying. Um, I think that with further research, if we're able to innovate technological ways to start to translate dolphin vocalizations, to even hear dolphin vocalizations, because they can communicate in um, uh, in ultrasonic uh, sound wavelengths as well, um, that 
we will probably eventually find out that dolphins are arguably as complex as we are culturally. They use tools. They pass the theory of mind test. Um, it's just that when we try to study them in captivity, they die young. They're not well suited to captive studies. When we try to study them in the wild, they swim a really long way. Um, and we can't follow them. We can't track them. We can't always record them. Um, we can't always even identify individuals. So um, don't necessarily buy into your textbook's assertion that humans are uh are like the penultimate of prime i mean we are well i don't know are we uh the penultimate of primates and that it's only humans who demonstrate some of these cultural traits because i really do think future evidence will support that line from um a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where the dolphins um predicted the the uh extermination of the earth and it left a note for the humans that was translated into so long and thanks for all the fish so you may go over this summary slide yourself um, and uh, as as I said in the text or in the audio portion here um, we've talked about uh, an extra credit opportunity we've also talked about um, what you can expect in your assignments for this week